Resiliency is something really fundamental to human experience, lived human experience, the need to be resilient. Uh, we are fast approaching a time in which not just simply will we erode uh, resiliency, but it might actually, it might actually, you know, completely, uh, the task might be, you know, uh, be actually completed where we almost remove the capacity for resiliency, you know, within us. Um, a lot of the conversations that I have with, with my friends tends to revolve around this. And Ironically, a lot of the conversations that I have with Muslim parents also revolves around the idea of being resilient. That, um, in particular, the issue of Islamophobia has really problematized um, how we can separate legitimate over-the-line, anti-Muslim bias from just a, the normal background, ambient kind of <laughs> tension that you get in, in a society. And I see that we've seemed to have taken a lot of our, we've seemed to have taken a lot of our talking points from certain movements, uh, particularly uh, certain movements within um, the civil rights movement. And one, there's some false equivalency going on here that the, uh, that the same difficulties that Muslims are facing today is equivalent to what African Americans faced. Um, and I'm not saying that, of course, being Muslim doesn't preclude being black. I mean, the irony of me talking about that should kind of put that to bed. But at the same time, I feel that if we allow ourselves to only operate within paradigms that are constructed by the dominant culture, and here the dominant culture doesn't only have to be white, uh, particularly the subdominant culture that has come to define um, various different social struggles in America has has very much been defined by the African American Christian experience. And Muslims need to come to define their own struggles for themselves. Within that though, I'm a little concerned about our tendency to buy into narratives of victimology. And uh, I, I had a case where uh, a Muslim, Muslim couple came, you know, they have a young kid in elementary school, and they were complaining about uh, their child being bullied. And after talking with them, it became apparent that it was actually more of just kind of general playground rules. I don't know if it's because of, you know, when I grew up, not so much where, but when I grew up, that, yeah, I mean, there was certainly what you could call some bullying going on and other things. But if we sterilize the environment to such an extent that our children never learn how to deal with tension, then they will be hamstrung, heavily hamstrung when they reach adulthood. And this is not saying that there are not legitimate cases where aggression goes over, you know, uh, goes out of bounds, right? And therefore, then we definitely have to deal with that. Um, but when I was young, uh, I dealt with a number of those similar issues and having to get in there and work it out definitely has helped contribute to me growing up to being uh, a confident adult and able to tackle the rigors of life. Uh, if we allow ourselves, 
you know, to be led down this road, I'm very, very concerned about what that might mean um, if we allow ourselves to scrub the environment of any tension, of any difficulty. And some of it just is not dealing with some uh, intricate parts of human nature that are unlikely to ever really change. And that doesn't mean we shouldn't go beyond human danger. In fact, you know, there are many, many instances in the Quran and many instances in Islam where, you know, Allah asks us to go above and beyond uh, our baser nature, undoubtedly. Um, But it's not a kind of other extremism, right, where... um, it removes the, path, the, the, the it removes the necessity for resiliency. In fact, you know there are numerous aspects in the Quran uh, that speak of the need of resiliency. You know, wasta'inu bil sabri wa salah, right? Uh, seek aid and assistance through first off just taking it, and then with prayer, because. You know that verse is interesting, where Allah doesn't say seek assistance first through God. You know, through sabr, right? I mean, through through prayer, and then through perseverance. Meaning that you're going to have to take it, and then you will you can call upon God. Uh, but understand, you may call, and He may still choose that you go through a certain kind of experience. And I'm concerned about that today. Um, it also has the tendency to make legitimate issues elevating them to the level where they become the only issues. And I know this will probably seem, you know, uh, like some kind of uh, crass conservatism, but one of my issues with the current crusade going on against white supremacy is that it elevates white supremacy to the point that it's the only challenge facing people of color today. Uh, And this isn't to downplay the legitimate issues with white supremacy. Uh, It definitely exists. It definitely has an impact. I don't agree with certain people that say, well, white supremacy doesn't have any impact on on black life today or black and brown life, right? Uh, I disagree with that. What I disagree with is it's the only thing we need to be worried about. It's all, and this this kind of circles back around to the necessity for one part of the strategy of dealing with white supremacy or any other kind of dhulam, right? Any kind of oppression. Part of the a necessary strategy, not a tactic, but a necessary strategy of dealing with any kind of dhulam will have to include a spirit of perseverance, sabr, for lack of a better word. And, And this is not a form of uh, religious quietism, right, where you be, you just sort of like, you know, tuck your chin and, and you take it. No, but you will have to exhibit some type of resiliency because when you're in the midst of oppression, in the midst of whatever challenge that Allah uh, is, is giving you, you will need to have that in order to not lose all sense of self. And in fact, there's the verse where Allah says in Surah Al-Baqarah, and that was indeed an enormous, uh, uh, an enormous test from your Lord when Allah talks about uh, how the children of Israel were enslaved by the, the Egyptians and were brutalized and their children were murdered and their women, you know, uh, were, were, you know, perhaps raped or mistreated or, or whatever or were forced to watch this. Uh, men were emasculated, right? And the response that Allah says about this, like, yes, this indeed was an enormous test from your Lord. Um, so there, I think, you know, part of the strategy is you have to have a sense of sabr. Then there has to be some rules of engagement, right, of how you go about, you know, solving the issue. Uh, obviously, we don't believe, at least from a Muslim point of view, in a sort of uh, uh, the ends justify the means. Um the other thing is that there are numerous issues that we are facing or m- perhaps numerous manifestations of dhulam uh, that are not only white supremacist in nature, um, 
you know, I, I've had a conversation just over the last week with several friends of mine, black, white, uh, brown, everything in between. And most of us are, you know, we have many concerns for our children, for our families that uh, were, for some of us, may indeed include certain uh, 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 reservations or concerns about white supremacy. It definitely ain't the only one. Um, and this be- can become blinding, right? And we have to make sure that our narrative about this is one that it, it, it scans the whole entire field. I mean, this is kind of like being in a battle and becoming fixated only on one target or only one part of the enemy that is making a certain kind of move uh, without assessing the entire situation. Um, and then therefore, and this is, this is, I think, another perhaps uncomfortable thing for some people to realize is that, you know, the landscape has changed. For some black and brown people, white supremacy may not be the number one issue. Uh, times have changed, populations have changed, uh, and therefore there may not even be a consensus anymore um, amongst black and brown people that white supremacy is, you know, certainly maybe not even the number one concern and definitely not the only concern. Now, this seems to, I don't know, really kind of seems to rattle uh, people coming from uh, certain perspectives of talking about race, racism, white supremacy, which it should not be taken as a denial, but it those fields of studies have to acknowledge that com, you know different communities and even different time periods of certain communities are not monoliths, and that they are free to decide what is their biggest you know what is their biggest challenge. I think there's enough room for all of us to determine that, you know, perhaps for a certain community or in a certain time of place, perhaps white supremacy legitimately is the biggest issue, right? But if there are those that say, well, you know what, that is a concern of mine, but not a major priority, they should not be ostracized or, uh, uh, you know, grilled for not being black enough or sold out or not woke enough or not in touch enough or whatnot. I think this is a mistake uh, that's influenced by certain, you know, actors coming out of the academy that, you know, have undoubtedly studied some really important things and have brought to light uh, some some really important investigations into different forms of uh, oppression, uh, including white supremacy, but need to understand that it is, it might not be the be all end all for some people. Um, and that I certainly feel, particularly when it comes to the black community, uh, we can't have any conversation about self actualization. We can't have any conversation about self improvement. We can't have any conversation about. Uh, self-betterment without discussing morality and that morality is undoubtedly meaning like you know policing ourselves right uh that morality undoubtedly is one of the or lack thereof right is one of the biggest issues plaguing the black community now this isn't to say that blacks are somehow uniquely immoral i don't believe that that's that's one of my issues with a lot of black conservatives Uh, I don't buy into the notion that we are, you know, uh, innately, uniquely more immoral than anybody else. But we do have a problem of immorality that is existentially and imminently and very much dealing and contributing to our demise. And in fact, I think in either in some aspects and in some times and places, that may be a greater threat or detriment to black life than white supremacy. Now, look, when I'm, you know, I just had this happen the other day driving, you know, in my truck and a cop pulling up behind me. And yeah, I get nervous just like anybody else that's driving while black because, you know, when you have those types of encounters, yeah, that's when, you know, the, the, that's when the meter goes to 10 and you start freaking out. Um, but obviously not every moment of my life is a traffic stop. Um, 
and there may be some other uh, aspects of my life that I want to focus on or other challenges or other hurdles I need to overcome that white supremacy honestly has, you know, either nothing to do with or doesn't play a central role in. Um, I think doing so would actually be very beneficial to black psychology because it, one, helps to counteract a kind of... Um, victimology narrative that I don't feel is productive whatsoever in our community, um, and that uh, historical injustices be what they are, and we are not the first community to have been brutalized in history. Um, we have to think about not just simply holding Chuck accountable <laughs> uh, and trying to uh, see if we can pin him to the mat and get our reparation, reparations check out of him, as much as I would love to get my reparations check, I just don't think it's going to happen. We have to start looking to other forms of self-resiliency that undoubtedly will require a return to morality, traditional morality. Obviously, I'm speaking as an imam, so I think we are very much in need of a return to uh, revelatory, uh, uh, prophetic morality as a means of solving uh, our, our crisis. Um, we cannot, you know, we can talk about funding of schools and this and that and the, in the prison industrial complex, which is a real thing. At the end of the day, though, poverty alone cannot be blamed for a person deciding to kill another person. You know, I was, um, you know, we, we do have to deal with those issues. Uh, sexual immorality creates unbelievable poverty and instability uh, in our communities that fundamentally undermines any chances of black and brown children growing up in stable households, feeling loved and not needing validation uh, through, through other means. Uh, I know that this tends to irk or rile some people um, because it sounds like talking points from a black conservative. And, as I, and I've, I've talked before, I have many issues with mainstream black conservatism. Uh, at the same time, I also have main problems with mainstream liberal uh, uh, liberalism. Uh, I feel that neither of them uh, really have the best interest in the black community at heart. And therefore, as, as black American Muslims, right, or just as the American Muslim community, uh, we need to reshape and rethink how we give da'wah, how we proselytize to the black community. What are we really offering? Um... And then for those of us within the community, right, we need to think about um, the choices that we're making and the lives that we are, 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 are living. Um, and that you really might be surprised of just how much bang for your buck you can get with morality in terms of overcoming historical injustices and oppression. Um, I'm not saying it is a silver bullet for everything, but it has to be brought back into and has to have a central uh, position in our conversation and strategies going forward. So, you know, I, I I'm a little I'm a little fatigued, to be quite honest, over the last month or two with all of uh, the conversation about race within our community and that. I think we we need a, a we need we need to return to the book of Allah and return to the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and really ask ourselves: um, Are we dealing with dhulam? Are we dealing with oppression, or are we going off of somebody else's playbook? Um, we need to, you know. Actually, I was talking with my friend Abdullah, and. I was saying that, you know, just, just take the conversation of um, empowering women in the Muslim community, particularly in, say, the black American Muslim community or the convert Muslim community, which would include, you know, white women and Latina women and so on, right? But let's just say we want to talk about the empowerment of Muslim women. A lot of this will come with, you know, obviously, you know, women being educated and then going into the workforce. However... Obviously, the education problem, uh, our education is, 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 is an obvious necessity. 
but the method in which they go into the workforce, perhaps we should have a different conversation about that, where instead of just turning people over to the sort of nine to five corporate machine, perhaps we could have a conversation in the Muslim community about uh, maybe not just conversation, but like we need to strategize how to empower our women through entrepreneurship so that they can, you know, they can make that money, they can become economically empowered, they can also become fulfilled and, and all those other things. But it also allows them perhaps to live lifestyles of which they can also prioritize their families. Um, they can be there for the important developmental years of being mothers for young children. They can also be there to emotionally support marriages and sustain their marriages because husbands got needs too. Um, and perhaps also this will motivate you know some young Muslim men to also get out there because I do see too many you know women out there really doing some stuff, and I see too many. Um, too many young men, man, kind of like sitting on the couch playing Fortnite until three in the morning. Um, which is why I said, you know, the, the, the best way for us to get results, right, in our community is for us to police ourselves. If we turn over the policing of ourselves to, say, the police, who we know are a brutalizing agency, right? There ain't no doubt about that the police are a brutalizing agency, but if we turn over the policing of ourselves to them, then we, in a sense, inevitably invite that kind of brutalization in. We would love to be able to change the police department and whatnot. I don't see those things happening, at least not for a long time. And I'm not saying we shouldn't work at it, but in the short term, <laughs> can we also once again bring morality back into a central part of the conversation, which includes we have to police ourselves. Um, Men have to allow, ha, men should be allowed to police men again. Um, as we're talking about, right, with, you know, men getting off the couch and working and other things, is that one of the best ways to do that is not just having social programs, that's true, but also creating a culture in which it's okay for men to get on other men and be like, yo, Get up off the couch, man, and go get a job. Get out there, you know, get married. Stop messing around with side pieces. Stop fornicating. Um, get out there and work a real job, right? And staying on top of, you know, allowing men to police other men when it comes to areas of, like, you know, even, you know, marital fidelity, where that has to become a stigma in the community, but that stigma is best applied and maintained uh, of men being on top of other men. I know this seems almost, you know, something from another dimension today when you start talking about uh, men policing other men, but I really don't see where the inviting of various institutions into communities has brought about any better results. Um, and likewise, I think it can even work amongst women where women can be also allowed to... Uh, keep each other, you know, as they say, steel sharpened steel or stone sharpened steel, right? Um, these are just some other, these are other strategies we need to enter, entertain as we deal with all of the different challenges of life. So I just wanted to share some of these thoughts off the top of my head, um, things that have really, uh, really been important to me and I've wanted to find a way to articulate uh trying to be as elegant and, and, and precise as possible because I want, I want the gist of what I'm trying to say to be understood and, and for the, to have the least amount of triggering, each, even though I hate that word, um, so that we can get down to you know, real brass tacks. But inshallah, leave some comments. Let me know your thoughts. See you soon, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum.